Black Doctors Podcast highlights the stories of minority professionals with the goal of inspiring others. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and share with others, because the next generation can't be what they don't see. Tune in every Monday to hear our stories told by us. Hello, and welcome back to the Black Doctors Podcast. I'm Stephen, your host. This episode, I'm so excited to be speaking with Dr. Stephen Noble. He is a cardiothoracic surgeon. He is a graduate of Xavier University in Louisiana before going on to to complete medical school in Indiana. Um, He is a veteran of the United States Navy, where he practiced on active duty for several years before leaving to practice in the civilian world. Dr. Noble, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Dr. Bradley, thanks so much uh, for having me on the show. Please call me Stephen. All right, Stephen. Stephen is Stephen. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Right on. So I think probably the most important or most uh, impressive things, right? You know, brain surgeons and heart surgeons are like two of the most impressive fields of medicine. And you are holding it down in cardiothoracic surgery, a field that is not incredibly diverse. Let's start by talking about your story and how you got into the field of medicine. Oh, great. Well, thank you for that. My path uh, to medicine really started in my hometown of Portland, Oregon. And I recall it vividly uh, being on the living room floor of my grandparents' uh, living room and just flipping through the encyclopedia. They had a special encyclopedia. I think it was like an Encyclopedia Britannica in which you could uh, go to the organ system and you would flip the skeletal system. Then there was a transparency page for the nervous system, then another one for the vascular system, so on and so forth. And that would just fascinate me for hours. And it was really that quest to try to figure out why things happened, you know, trying to find out more knowledge about the human body. And I was a really inquisitive kid in regards to why people got old, why people got sick, uh, why people go to this certain place and either get better or not return. And that sort of interest uh, in the human body uh, really led to my desire to be in a physician. And at a young age, I can recall uh, telling my family that I wanted to be a doctor. And my family just really supported me uh, throughout my, my growing up. And so both my family, my parents, uh, my grandparents, uh, and just really the extended village, the extended community really pushed me. And it was amazing how in putting that out there, uh, uh, to my friends and family, how my path was almost directed in a certain sense. Hmm. Uh, if I wanted to get in trouble and do certain things, you know, you'd have friends that would say, that's not for you or, or you're destined for, for something else. And so it really was um, similar to the, uh, the gospel song, Order My Steps, in which uh, putting that out there, uh, the, the community around me, uh, the community around it, around me really surrounded me with, with uh, support and, and, and guidance. And that was much appreciated. So with that, I was always in classes or really looking to uh, make myself a a good student. Uh, uh, And so I had some opportunities to to go to uh, University of Toledo on a full ride. But when I got a postcard in the mail from Xavier University of Louisiana, I had never heard of the university before. Uh, and so we went down to visit and, and at the time I, I was in, uh, graduated from high school in 96. And so during that time, uh, the TV show, a different world, uh, was very popular <laughs> yeah. and that experience of the HBCU was ingrained in my head. And so when I went to Xavier, it was truly like going to a different world. I mean, New Orleans is a place all to itself, the food, the people, the culture. And I just fell in love with Xavier as soon as I stepped foot on the campus and it was really the, the library uh, that really just made me fall in love because it was that place that I felt like, yeah, I can spend the next four years of my life in, here in this library, here in this institution. Now, I didn't spend four years in the library, <laughs> but uh, as, a, as a senior in high school, I, I, I thought this is where uh, I, could really, I should really go. So I made the commitment to go to Xavier University, and it was one of the best decisions uh, in my life that I made. Uh, it was number one at the time for putting blacks in the medical school. So it just seemed like a natural fit um, as far as my career path in medicine, as well as uh, getting that foundation of going to a historically black college or university or HBCU. And and like I said, Xavier and New Orleans is the second home. And I love that place to death. Yeah. So clearly you worked hard while you're at Xavier. You went from Xavier to Indiana University where you did a master's program before starting medical school there. And, And what was your experience like in Indiana? Uh, Indiana was great. Uh, I had a great time in Indiana. Uh, I got to admit that when my parents dropped me off at Xavier, they ended up moving from Toledo, Ohio to South Bend, Indiana. 
So I got in-state tuition uh, Mm -hmm. as a medical student. And so, uh, as I mentioned, New Orleans is a great place and and I had probably a little bit too much fun. And so I did the (laughs) master's program and it was a great opportunity to to really buckle down and kind of learn a lot about myself in regards to uh, my strengths and weaknesses as a student and focus on those um, on those areas that I need to improve on and those weaknesses and really take some cold, uh, cold, hard looks in the mirror as to how to make myself a better student. The one of the greatest things that I learned about that year was uh, the importance of having positive peer influence. I think it reinforced that. So study groups, um, really trying to figure out, really uh, understanding that iron does uh, sharpen iron. And so having some uh, colleagues that can hold you accountable and, and really uh, push you to greater heights uh, was what really uh, led to the success that I, that I experienced in that year and was able to go to Indiana University the following year. Uh, Indiana University was a great experience. Uh, I really enjoyed my time there. And um, uh, that uh, really led to me. Uh, two things happened as far as uh, taking a scholarship with the Navy. Uh, I was a first year medical student during 9-11. And mm-hmm. so I remember like it was yesterday. And uh, after that sort of experience um, and understanding that I want to do surgery, uh, I I looked at uh, doing the health professions uh, scholarship program uh, with the United States Navy uh, for two reasons. One, there was that uh, sense of patriotism. Two, uh, it was going to help pay for med school. And three, with the path that I was on as far as pursuing surgery, uh, I had realized that a lot of the advances that we have made uh, in medicine and in surgery uh, we had made those advances uh, during during conflicts. Um, the Vietnam War gave us uh, knowledge about uh, fluid resuscitation. And uh, the, this Iraq and Afghanistan conflict really has uh, taught us a lot about uh, uh, blood uh, 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 hemorrhage, uh, hemorrhage control and the importance of stopping bleeding at the site. So uh, going into the military and, and having the goal of, of wanting to uh, participate in deployment medicine and be deployed in a, in a battlefield was something that uh, was always a dream of mine. So uh, I took a scholarship with the Navy. Yeah. And coming out of medical school, you knew you wanted to be a surgeon. Did you know you wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon at that point in time? No, I didn't. Uh, it was funny because as a third year resident, uh, or excuse me, as a third year medical student, I can recall uh, getting ready to scrub into a transplant surgery and the transplant fellow you know, someone who had, was uh, doing some specialty training in transplant was asking me, what was I thinking about? And I told him that I was leaning towards surgery. And he looked at me as we're scrubbing uh, hands at the scrub sink. And he says, you're not going to go into surgery. You either know it or you don't. And it was really at that <laughs> moment that he said that, that it was like, you know what, I'm going to do surgery. And so I really thought I was going to do trauma. And so I came out of Indiana University uh, with some great mentors uh, Dr. Clark Simons, that still, uh, who's still there to this day, um, was a, a great mentor of mine. And uh, I wanted to be like Dr. Simons and, and be a trauma surgeon. Uh, however, I got to OHSU, Oregon Health Science University. And I recall a lecture that we had, Grand Rounds, uh, at the end of my intern year, uh, in which the speaker, who was a graduating uh, cardiac surgery uh, fellow, uh, given a talk about the future of CT surgery, uh, stating that it's more than just four operations. And it was that uh, that grand rounds that really got me interested in, in cardiothoracic surgery. And so as a second year resident working at the Portland VA Medical Center in Portland, Oregon, uh, it was my first rotation and I was uh, of my second year and it was in uh, CT surgery and I just loved it. And it was after that rotation that I made the, the decision to, to go into a cardiac surgery. And cardiac surgery at the VA was, was something that was, uh, initially, I, th- it was, I thought it would be intimidating, but I realized that at the VA, uh, especially the heart patients, there were just some two core things that most of the guys just wanted to do. They wanted to be able to uh, do the finer, what they considered the finer things in life. That is, uh, be able to cut their grass and, and to be able to have a uh, personal relationship with their significant other. <laughs> and so with that being said, uh, heart surgery provided that uh, for these guys. And, and it's interesting to think about uh, the, the origins of, of Viagra, uh, you know, with the VA. And so uh, to that point, uh, I enjoyed my experience both 
uh, treating those patients, but also having uh, a great mentor uh, at the VA, Dr. Ravi, and uh, uh, the, the fellow, the CT surgery fellow at the time, uh, uh, Kai Ingstad. And so uh, I say all that to say that mentorship and, and having individuals that kind of take you underneath their wing uh, has really been something that has been important to my career and has really been some of the pivotal moments as to why I've gone into the, the fields that I've gone into and or uh, some of the decisions that I made. Absolutely. Mentorship is key. And we're definitely going to touch on that a little later on. Now, coming out of medical school, because you had accepted the health profession scholarship from the Navy, how did you end up being able to go out to a civilian residency? That's a great question. So as you recall, um, I took the scholarship uh, at the time that we were uh, that 9-11 happened. And so the at at that time, um, the conflict, uh, the war in Afghan, Iraq and Afghanistan uh, which is getting started underway. And so the military had made some uh, some predictions as to uh, how to create, you know, what would be the quickest way to create uh, trauma surgeons, basically individuals that could deploy uh, to to these conflicts. And the quickest way for me to be produced as a as a surgeon was for me to do a full uh, civilian deferment. Mm-hmm. So that allowed me to do my training exclusively in the civilian world at OHSU. And uh, that led to me being able to come out of uh, the Navy, uh, excuse me, come out of OHSU in 2011. And uh, in in 2011, although I knew I wanted to do CT surgery, uh, instead of going to uh, uh, CT surgery training or fellowship, I ended up going to 29 Palms, California for two years, which was a great experience because um, it's uh, what folks don't realize is that 29 Palms is one of the largest uh, live fire Marine Corps training institutions uh, in the world. So hmm. uh, individuals at that base get to simulate what it's like to be in combat um, with uh, planes, uh, flying overhead, helicopters, you know, tanks, the full deal. The local community um, uh, will role play as uh, Afghans and, and they will really create that whole desert the Mojave Desert into a, an environment that simulates uh, Afghanistan or Iraq. Wow. And so uh, it was pretty interesting to be a general surgeon out there at the time because we would see individuals, uh, see the Marines before they went off to, to war. And so um, before a unit would deploy, they would come to 29 Palms, get some simulated training, and then they would, uh, quote unquote, ship out to Afghanistan. And then, uh, so it was interesting to see people ship out uh, to Afghanistan, but I also uh, see these individuals return from combat. And it was seeing uh, these young men and women return from combat in which I uh, got to treat these individuals uh, from their wounds um, that I really got the full uh, sense of, of what uh, combat medicine was like. Um, and, and to see the, the wounds and, and the devastation uh, that can occur, uh, especially from uh, IEDs or uh, improvised explosive devices and how debilitating um, you know, those uh, uh, injuries can be, um, especially as it destroys the, the, the lower half, the legs, the perineum of our, of our young active duty soldiers. And so that was uh, really something that stuck with me uh, and, and, and really uh, interested me as, as far as uh, uh, CT surgery and then ultimately going to, uh, to deploy myself uh, to Afghanistan, which was by far one of the greatest uh, uh, aspects of my military career. Yeah. Where did you go in Afghanistan? So I was in Kandahar, Afghanistan from 2016 to 2017, and it was a part of Operation Enduring Freedom. And uh, at that time, uh, our uh, the U.S. Uh, war effort was such that we were in a, a, a train, advise, and assist role. So we were mainly providing uh, support to the Afghan uh, National Army in the, uh, in the Afghan country. And that support uh, was uh, support in both logistics, uh, military support, but where we came into play was medical support. Afghanistan uh, didn't have, uh, because of the war, didn't have a robust sort of medical system. And so uh, the local hospital in Kandahar, we could uh, overran. And it was interesting that in the Kandahar hospital, Afghan nationals would be treated right next, uh, right alongside uh, Taliban uh, fighters. And so at our hospital, uh, we took care of uh, Afghan nationals. And, and most of the individuals that we did, we did take care of uh, were Afghan nationals, um, as most of our, our U.S. Uh, uh, servicemen and women 
uh, we're no longer uh, actively fighting. We are uh, in a in assist role, but we weren't having the large sort of platoon uh, engagements. Although we did see some casualties, U.S. casualties um, from our uh, special forces operators, uh, we weren't seeing the same sort of U.S. casualties that our previous uh, colleagues uh, saw in the early uh, years of the conflict. Yeah, you were over there for six months or nine months? Uh, six months, thank God. So, yeah, for the <laughs> Navy, our, our deployments uh, in country over in Afghanistan were six months, whereas our, our Army uh, uh, comrades, uh, they would be over there for nine months to a year. So, uh, thank God for six month deployments. Go Army. Yeah. <laughs> Man, so you, you had an incredible experience for two years, saw some amazing things. Um, sort of, you saw some very tough things overseas as well but you still had that passion and desire to become a cardiothoracic surgeon. So you went on to apply to and be accepted to fellowship at uh, The Ohio State University. How was your experience there? It was amazing. Um, it, again, I guess the theme is just mentorship. Uh, at the time when I was uh, applying for uh, fellowship programs, uh, I wanted to go to a place that uh, I felt I would get a well-rounded education. And it was during the interview process uh, that I met, or it was during the, uh, you know, as a resident, um, I became aware of uh, the organization Society of Black Academic Surgeons. And it was during a trip to SBAS that I met one of my, uh, I met up with one of my colleagues from college, um, who was actually um, a uh, colorectal surgeon, and she had just finished her training at Rush University. And she made mention when I told her that I was interested in going into CT surgery. She made mention of the fact, oh, you should look out and look at uh, the Ohio State because my former program director is now the chair there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, she had mentioned uh, an individual by the name of Dr. Uh, Bob Higgins. And so, uh, you know, I told her I'll I'll check it out. And so I interviewed at uh, the Ohio State and um, it was at a dinner talking uh, with the attendings and talking with uh, Dr. Higgins that I realized that this was the place for me and it was really due to mentorship. Uh, I really felt that by going to OSU, I would be able to get the mentorship and the training that I would, that I would need to make me a, a, a great surgeon. And uh, it was a, a decision that I don't regret. Uh, my two years there at the Ohio State were um, some, some of the uh, best years of my training to really give my all into CT surgery, uh, treat the patients that we did from a variety of uh, complex lung cancer surgeries to transplant surgeries, uh, uh, both uh, lung transplant and heart transplants. Uh, and, and really, uh, Columbus is a great city. And I, I really enjoyed my two years there. Uh, and at the time that I was there, uh, the Ohio State won uh, the first <laughs> uh, BCS national championship. So uh, that was great uh, to be a part of that. Um, and uh, due to the fact that they beat uh, my hometown, uh, my home state, Oregon Ducks, I had to, I lost a bet and, and had to renounce my fandom for the oh, Oregon man. Ducks and become a OSU fan. So uh, go Buckeyes, OH. <laughs> they let you back out West after that? <laughs> they, they had to, they had to. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's awesome. So in a two-year fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery, can you break down what that two years entails? Like, is it 50-50 cardiac surgery and thoracic surgery or, or what type of rotations and, and things did you learn? Yeah, great question. So uh, I chose that program because I knew that after uh, that training, I would have to go back into the Navy. And in the Navy, uh, you, as a surgeon, you're doing both uh, hearts and lungs. And so I wanted a, a program that can give me a, a good general uh, sort of breadth of knowledge of, of both fields. So um, in the first year of, of, of training, it was primarily thoracic. So I spent uh, six months on thoracic and then uh, uh, three months. Uh, so thoracic surgery, uh, general thoracic surgery is uh, dealing with uh, lungs, uh, the esophagus um, and mediastinal. So things in the uh, mediastinum or, in the, uh, or within the chest. And so uh, you're dealing with lung cancer, primarily esophageal cancer. And then every now and then a uh, uh, mediastinal mass or tumor thymoma. Did that for six months. I uh, spent a three-month rotation doing congenital uh, heart surgery, oh. so that's uh, heart surgery for for kids and uh, those uh, individuals that may have um, congenital defects. Uh, and so that can be uh, some complex uh, operations, uh, especially with uh, uh, 
uh, that are pretty small. And so uh, as uh, some of our attendings, we used to talk about, uh, you know, these are individuals with funny frog hearts. Um, they have some sort of congenital abnormality that you try to go in and quickly fix. Uh, it's interesting that uh, one of my heroes uh, in, in medicine, uh, in surgery, uh, uh, his claim to fame is uh, in regards to genital heart surgery, and that's uh, Vivian Thomas, in, mm. in, uh, who helped uh, uh, pioneer the, the Blaylock tossing Thomas shunt uh, to help with uh, the blue baby syndrome or tetralogy of Fallot. So to do uh, congenital heart surgery and, and to almost uh, walk in the shoes of, of Vivian Thomas was great. Uh, but it was definitely something that I knew that I did not want to do further training to do congenital heart surgery. Yeah. And it's complex uh, to understand uh, some aspects of, uh, of CT surgery, let alone adding congenital in there. It can get very, very complex. So kudos to those congenital heart surgeons out there because uh, they are truly um, <laughs> angels of the Lord. And so, at, so that's uh, uh, three months of congenital surgery. And then we, you do another uh, three months of adult cardiac surgery. And then my second year was primarily uh, split between doing uh, the majority of uh, adult cardiac surgery and then doing three to uh, three months of uh, thoracic surgery. And uh, one of the things uh, that uh, that I picked up uh, in, in thoracic surgery was doing a robotic assisted thoracic surgery. So I'm a big fan of robotic assisted surgery and, and uh, love that modality uh, to death. And uh, it's funny as an avid uh, video gamer, I, I meaning <laughs> I play a lot. I'm not that good, but I play a lot. Uh, it's it's very similar uh, the, the skills of, of video gaming, esports, and uh, robotic assisted surgery. It's, it's amazing how uh, my son, who is now 18, put him on the the robotic surgery console, and he plays a lot of video games, and he just takes to it like a fish to water. And so um, it was it was truly amazing to get that cutting edge sort of uh, education uh, from the Ohio State. So then you returned to the Navy. How much time did you owe the Navy at this point? Uh, three years. And so, um, after, uh, so in 2015, uh, I went from uh, Columbus to Portsmouth, Virginia, um, and, uh, set foot on at Naval Medical Center, Portsmouth, uh, knowing that I owed them uh, three more years uh, of my commitment, uh, to the Navy. And as much as I love the Navy, um, and enjoyed the time that I deployed, uh, between, uh, 2016 and 2017, Cardiac surgery is one in which uh, the, the majority of our patients are, are 65 and, and above, especially as it relates to uh, cardiac disease and, and, and uh, doing uh, the most common surgery that we do, coronary bypass surgery. Uh, you're just not doing uh, that surgery that often uh, in the active duty population. Yeah. So um, as much as I wanted to stay in the Navy, uh, the way that the Navy medicine was designed at the time, just really didn't allow for uh, naval service, in, in my mind, to stay uh, truly uh, uh, abreast on, uh, or uh, active doing cardiac surgery. I felt very comfortable in doing thoracic surgery and we and did quite a few thoracic cases, but I wanted to be doing more cardiac cases. And so with that, I got out of the Navy in 2018. Yeah, I, I just missed you because I came to Portsmouth in 2018 in July. Oh, oh you're exactly right because that, that is exactly when I left. <laughs> was uh it was uh june july uh, i was on terminal leave so i didn't have to set foot on a hospital during july but yeah rolled out uh soon thereafter so the last couple of years you've practiced in the civilian world can you describe what your practice is like maybe for some aspiring uh some medical students or residents that are maybe thinking about thoracic surgery what is your typical day week month like in in your practice yeah, great question. So um, it's, it's definitely different from uh, military medicine. And so the, the practice uh, can vary. So, um, you know, one of the first things that I would recommend uh, to the uh, medical student or, or, or resident that's out there, um, when you go to the, pro there's a lot of questions that you could ask, you know, as far as the program and the practice, uh, most importantly is your partners, um, who your colleagues are, uh, makes a big difference. And mm -hmm. so, um, uh, making sure that, uh, you have, uh, good partners and you don't have to be best of friends, but partners that you can definitely lean on, uh, cause you know, although you may have done fellowship and you, you know, you may have been the greatest resident coming out of your training program. Uh, practicing out in the community, practicing out in the real world is totally different. And so one aspect uh, that I had to learn um, you know, when I got out to the community was being able to, um, uh, was marketing, uh, being able to kind of market yourself, get out into the community, uh, 
yourself to the community. So as a new young surgeon, uh, you know, the community may not know you. So it's important to kind of get out there. So what does that look like? Uh, giving talks, giving presentations to the community about the diseases and uh, that treat, as well as the procedures that you do. So it, early on in my career, it was doing a lot of those uh, those talks. Um, and so it, it was kind of like uh, shaking hands and kissing babies and just uh, getting your name out there. Uh, and so it can be slow going at first, but, but doing those uh, uh, community conversations, I think is very important. And then as you build your practice, you try to set up your clinic days. And so I typically like to have uh, uh, one or two days of clinic. Uh, typically that for me, that clinic day was on a Wednesday. So I would see a new patient and, and then uh, so slowly but surely I'd start to see my follow up patients. And then you know, you're trying to figure out your block schedule day. And so typically uh, I had two days of, uh, of OR, um, OR block time. And so in those days, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, you're just trying to find cases uh, to put in there. And so uh, you're, you're seeing patients in clinic and then scheduling them for, for surgery. Uh, and typically my OR days would start uh, at about 730 and so that means you're getting up at about six, going into the hospital around, seeing patients, get something to eat right quick. And I'm one that I can't eat like a, a big meal uh, yeah. when, I, when I'm operating um, and because I don't like that feeling of feeling tired or lethargic. And, and in doing cardiac surgery, I really had to change some of my habits of drinking coffee. Uh, from the standpoint, I can't have, you know, uh, uh, you know, two cups of coffee before I operate and I really couldn't have a full cup. And so it, you know, oftentimes it'd just be a sip just to get that, you know, jolt of, of caffeine. Cause I realized if I had too much coffee, then I would, uh, my hands would shake and then get tremors. Uh -huh. And that's the last thing that you want, um, you know, being jacked up on caffeine and, uh, uh having tremors. So being able to uh, understand your own sort of body and, and what's best for you as far as uh, uh, your, your, whether it's your bowel or bladder habits, because, you know, when you're operating, sometimes these cases are four hours and, you know, unlike anesthesia, uh, we're not having <laughs> folks uh, break us out. So if you're doing an eight hour case, you know, that's that, you know, that's you right there standing for eight hours, uh, maybe, you know, no bathroom breaks, maybe not eating, not drinking. And uh, it's, for the force. And so uh, I say all that to say that it's not uncommon for my, for my weight to fluctuate uh, depending upon how much I'm operating or how little mm. I'm operating because of not being able to eat and, 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 uh, and do all the other sort of proper things for, for good nutritional health. So uh, one of the mantras is eat when you can, sleep when you can, and, but don't mess with the pancreas. Right, right. And so uh, uh, with that being said, um, surgeons oftentimes will try to eat as much as they can because we never really know when, when the next time we're going to be able to eat if we get stuck in a long case. Man. And, and so when you're operating, what are you doing? Like one case a day, two cases a day? I uh, try to do uh, as many cases as possible, but usually about uh, one to two cases um, when I do operate. Um, and so uh, there are those off days in which uh, you're you're just, you know, you're busy um, from sunup to sundown uh, doing cases. And what that is, is you have a couple of scheduled cases, but then you got all these cases from being on call. And mm -hmm. so uh, you're operating into the middle of the night and or, you know, you may get a disaster in which uh, you're going to be operating in the middle of the night because of sort of. Uh, disaster came in through the ER, but um, it, it, it's nice to, to leave. Uh, it's nice to leave before the sun goes down, but in the life of surgery, it's very common to, to show up to the hospital before the sun rises and to leave the hospital when the sun's, you know, after the sun is set. So uh, it can be uh, pretty difficult uh, in, in trying to do other things out of the hospital. I've been spending all, all day uh, in the operating room. Yeah. And, and are you still using the robot pretty frequently? And if so, which type of cases are you using a robot for? Uh, great question. Yeah, so I, I do. Um, my mantra uh, and my philosophy is trying to figure out, you know, why can I not use a robot? And I exclusively use a robot for thoracic surgery. And so um, I, I think that for thoracic surgery, uh, the robot, uh, the Da Vinci robot is a great tool. Um, and and so I like to use cases for lung cancer cases. Um, uh, robotic lobectomies are, are a great case uh, to use it for um, uh, mediastinal tumors, so thymomas, uh, uh, individuals with myasthenia gravis. Um, are, it, it's a great modality to use uh, the robot. Uh, I've used it for uh, the act when I was an active duty uh, surgeon uh, in the Navy. I would use a robot for uh, spontaneous pneumothoraces. And, hmm. um, you know, we would get these active duty pilots who would drop a lung or, or have a pneumothorax. 
and treatment for that uh, would be to uh, take the patient to the OR, um, uh, lop off uh, the top portion of their lung because they have like a bleb or air bubble um, or a little out pouching of their lung that may have ruptured or burst uh, that has caused for air to escape from the lung and, and the lung collapse. And so uh, we go into the operating room, we uh, take off that portion of the lung, and then we scrape up the inside of the lung to create scar to, to allow that lung to, uh, to stick and, and not fall back down again. And uh, unlike the civilian world in which you typically do that after the second episode, in the active duty world, we would do that after the first episode because, um, as you can imagine, uh, in the Navy, we have individuals that go to the extremes of atmospheric pressure. So our, our, our fighter pilots, so individuals going up into the air, as well as our, our divers, you know, mm -hmm. our submariners, so individuals going you know, underneath the sea. So with that being said, the last thing that you want is for these individuals to have a recurrent or for that uh, uh, collapsing of the lung to happen either while they're flying uh, their F-14 or while they're, you know, underneath the, the ocean and uh, far away from any sort of medical uh, care. So with that, we preemptively do the, uh, that sort of surgery uh, right after the first uh, episode. Yeah, no, that's interesting. You could tell you were in the service since you uh, appropriately said submariner versus uh, <laughs> sub submariner, which apparently is a subpar mariner. <laughs> 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 you know it's amazing the, the things that kind of stick stick with you and you kind of pick up uh just by happenstance but that was one of the uh fun things to do to always ask uh the active duty personnel and even my retired uh, uh patients that i see um you know what their what their position what their mos was uh in the military and so it's interesting the stories that they'll tell you um and, and so i always learn something uh from each and every patient i that i see and so it's great to ask some questions about their life in the military or their life uh, in their careers. Yeah. And, and uh, Stephen, so throughout your story, you've mentioned the importance of mentorship. And I think it's uh, absolutely crucial. And it's incredible how you have sought out ways to provide mentorship to others. You do this by partnering with the Black Men and White Coats group that is founded by Dr. Dale Okudarudu. Can you talk about what that partnership means to you and, and how you've seen its impact? Uh, that, that, that partnership means, means the world to me. Um, as you mentioned, mentorship has been a big aspect of, of, uh, my life and my career, um, ever since I was a kid. And so, uh, my parents, uh, made certain that I was, uh, connected or at least, uh, participating in youth organizations or groups, um, in which there were positive peer influences, uh, whether it's, uh, in high school with kudos or, um, in, in college, uh, pledging of fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, um, in med school uh, with SNMA, and then um, as uh, within uh, residency and training, continuing that in SBAS. And so when uh, uh, Dale, uh, when I found out about Black Men and White Coats, I, I think I was in the Navy. I, I was in the Navy at the time, and he had reached out to me um, about doing a, a podcast. And uh, it was truly a story, videos, and I just really fell in love with the whole notion of, of, of black men telling black men in white coats, uh, black male physicians telling their stories of medicine uh, in, a, in a way in which we have inspired the next generation. So uh, his Dale and Daniel's passion, his brother um, for mentorship, which is something that spoke to me uh, and something that I, I've always uh, really had a place in my heart for. So when he talked about uh, his, his vision, Dale had a vision of producing a documentary, uh, Black Men in White Coats. I mean, his vision for it as to what it was going to be, uh, it just sold me on with the saying that. He wanted to create the next generation's version of the book Gifted Hands. Mm. And for those that don't know, I mean, Gifted Hands was that was that book that really inspired me to, to go into medicine from the standpoint of, of reading and seeing Dr. Ben Carson's story and the things that he went through. I felt as, uh, it was one of those things that spoke to me from the standpoint of uh, here's a, a black man uh, with a story that really uh, that, that I could identify with some of the things that he experienced growing up. And it was that notion of if he could do it, then I could do it. Um, and of course, you know, he was a neurosurgeon and whatnot. But I really <laughs> felt that that story really inspired me to, uh, to, to really do that. So when Dale said that uh, he wanted to create a documentary that would be this generation's version of, uh, of the book Gifted Hands, 
uh, I felt I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, jump on as an associate producer for the documentary. And, and that was one of the greatest things that I've done uh, in medicine outside of uh, the clinical work that I do. And so uh, signing on as an associate producer for that, for that documentary, uh, highlighting that, you know, 2% of, of, of uh, uh, physicians are, are black men and how healthcare disparities uh, in large part are, are tied into just not having enough black male physicians. And yeah. one of the ways to address that is to create more black physicians. And so how do we do that? And so I felt that the documentary was definitely one way to do that. I felt that black men in white coats is part of that pipeline. And so we understand that there's the school to prison pipeline, but what I felt that black men in white coats is doing, organizations like the Comprehensive Minority Medical Mentoring Program is doing, is trying to create a pipeline of school to medicine. And I applaud all those organizations that do that. And I'm one of those individuals that uh, when I see uh, other people doing things that, I, that, that I, I, I'm a fan of and support, um, you know, I, I try to lend my efforts to that. And I don't necessarily need to create another pipeline program. But if I can be the pump uh, mm-hmm. for, for for these pipeline programs, you know, similar to the heart, you know, and it's just you just need a pump to kind of pump the blood through. Uh, it's the same way. You need a pump to kind of pump these uh, kids through these programs. And that's kind of how I see myself as being a pump for these pipeline programs. Uh, that inspired me to write a children's book, The Heart of the Hero, the story of Dr. Daniel Hell Williams. And that inspiration came from my work with Black Men in White Coats, uh, working with Dr. Dale, uh, who was a great sort of uh, peer uh, influencer and a peer advisor in, in producing that book. Um, and that book is really about telling the story of the uh, first successful heart surgeon that that performed the uh, heart surgery back in back in the 1900s uh, and, and, and really led to uh, kind of the pioneering work that we see today. And so um, with, with him uh, being able to perform the, that surgery uh, in 1893 and then helping kind of pioneer other aspects, uh, starting the first interracial hospital in the United States in wow. 1891. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so prior to uh, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who story is amazing in and of itself, uh, he, uh, son of uh, abolitionists whose father was the barber and uh, his father died uh, when, when Daniel was young. And Daniel followed in the footsteps of, of his father, becoming a barber himself at 17. And then he went on to medical school and then went on to, to realizing that, you know what, there's uh, health inequities you know, in our country, the fact that black people couldn't be treated at hospitals. And so he felt that, you know, we, this has to this has to change. And prior to that, individuals were being treated in their homes. And so what he did was he started the first interracial hospital in Chicago. And he did this with a uh, sponsor from uh, from white allies. And so it, back in the 1800s, 1891, uh, you really see how for for the community to heal, it takes individuals from all sides. So he created a hospital that had black physicians, white physicians. Was that Mercy? Uh, all black nurses. Uh, no, it was Provident Hospital. Yeah. So um, it was the only hospital at that time that had a, a training program for black nurses because Dr. Daniel Hill Williams realized that, you know, nursing care is pivotal. And we're seeing that again to this day mm-hmm. um, as we see nursing shortages with um, the COVID pandemic. And it was very interesting because Dr. Daniel Hill uh, Williams lived through the 1980 pandemic. And so he, uh, he himself uh, experienced, uh, you know, something similar to what we're dealing with uh, to this day. Uh, so writing that children's book, getting, giving that sort of story, um, hoping to inspire individuals to, yes, pursue medicine, but pursue whatever dreams that they have. And I think that um, our greatest asset in a society is our youth. Uh, um, they represent the future. And so whatever we can do to inspire the youth to be as great as they possibly can be uh, is something that we all should be about. And Dr. Uh, Williams had a line um, that I think is very apropos to, to today, uh, both as it was uh, back in the day, as far as uh, people who don't make provision for their own sick and suffering are not worthy of civilization. And so as we look at where we are in this day and age now, you know, it, at the border, as far as immigration, uh, health care, COVID-19, uh, uh, health care disparities, uh, it begs the question, if we don't make provision for our own sick and suffering, are we worthy of civilization? 
So these are some of the hard questions that we're a- that we're having to answer for ourselves right now. Um, and so uh, it grew back in the 1800s with Dr. Daniel Hale Williams and it's true to this day. And so in writing that children's book, it's uh, my hope is to inspire uh, the next generation of youth uh, and even adults, um, and, and anybody and everybody that picks up the book to really uh, ask themselves, are we worthy of civilization? And uh, have each a reader figure out what it is that they need to be to be the to awaken the heart of the hero that I think lives inside of each and every one of us. That's uh, fantastic. And and this has been an incredible conversation. Dr. Stephen Noble, you are a crowded thoracic surgeon, Navy veteran, associate producer of a documentary and uh, published author. Thank you so much for joining us on the show and just sharing a bit of all the things that you're into and what you're really doing to affect change in our community. For the folks listening, where can they find a copy of your book? Um, find out more about the things that you're up to and keep track of your career. Oh, great. So they can find the book on Amazon. Uh, so they can go to uh, Amazon.com. And again, it's the heart of a hero, the Dr. Daniel Hale Williams story. Uh, they can also uh, follow me on Twitter at Dr. Steve MD. And they can also uh, check me out on LinkedIn uh, at Stephen Noble uh, on LinkedIn. So uh, those are the places that they can follow the things that I'm doing. And uh, again, uh, thank you for this time. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. Dude, thanks so much for, uh, for coming on. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. The Black Doctors Podcast is a nonprofit volunteer passion project with the goal of inspiring all who listen. Tune in next week for another episode of the Black Doctors Podcast with Dr. Stephen Bradley, your friendly neighborhood anesthesiologist.